Welcome to this session, Battle of the APIs, RESTful versus GraphQL APIs. My name is Anshul Sharma, and I'm a solutions architect at AWS. In my role as a solutions architect, I have had the privilege of working with some of the prominent enterprises in Singapore, of which we have Singapore Exchange joining us today. Badri, who leads cloud engineering at SGX, will be co-presenting this session with me. In terms of agenda, we'll start by comparing RESTful APIs and GraphQL APIs, talking about pros and cons of each one of them. We will take some examples to deep dive on how each pattern works. Then we will look at implementing serverless REST and GraphQL APIs with Amazon API Gateway and AWS AppSync respectively. We will then discuss how do you pick between REST and GraphQL and finally hear from SGX on their API implementation and patterns. So let's get started. Now both REST and GraphQL APIs have many similarities. They both operate over HTTP or HTTPS protocol. They both are stateless communication platforms. The client and backend don't need an active connection or don't need to maintain state. And finally, both patterns standardize the client and server interactions by laying their own standards. So we all know REST. It's a proven age-old friend. It's been around for two decades, basically used everywhere in almost every single API platform. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and in most of the cases, it's delivered over JSON payload format. On the other hand, GraphQL is fairly young. It was publicly released by Facebook in 2015 and recently been open source to GraphQL Foundation. The GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API, gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. GraphQL APIs are also typically implemented with JSON payload format. Now let's see some of the major differences between both. So at a conceptual model, REST talks about the resource. You can think of a resource as a virtual file on the server. As a result, when you are expanding REST APIs, you are expanding different URIs. In some ways, you can have a graph of data by having hyperlink from one resource to another, but GraphQL makes this model explicit. It says core conceptual model is graph with nodes, edges, and attributes. GraphQL declares everything as a graph. You say what you want, and then you will get that. Second, REST does not adhere to a strongly typed schema, while GraphQL, at its core, works around a strongly typed model, giving you benefits such as automatic validation and introspection. Next, we have the most prominent fundamental difference. So in REST, the server controls the response sent to the client, while in GraphQL, your client controls the response returned by the server by asking for specific fields. This leads to a major problem with REST. They suffer with over or underfetching, that is, returning more or less data than required. So even if you are interested in a single field, you still have to fetch all the data in the response. Now GraphQL solves this by allowing the client to ask for exactly what it needs and the server returns just that. Lastly, REST works in a request response model while GraphQL also supports that it can also provide data in real time with something called as subscriptions. Now let's quickly refresh our REST concepts. So REST is designed for servers client sends a request by combining a mandatory HTTP method, or sometimes referred as verb, resource path with an optional path or query parameter, and an optional body. So let's take some examples. So slash weather path is a get method providing a single query parameter, zip, with a value 11111. So I can also provide a path parameter. So in a second example at middle, I'm querying slash restaurants by providing a path 11111. Now server returns response with a static schema and pre-programmed payload format. 
So clients must consume the responses by passing and extracting the fields that they need. Now with REST, client specifies the HTTP method that indicates the intended action. For example, POST is typically used to create or add records, GET is for fetching only, DELETE as name suggests for deleting a record, uh, PUT and PATCH to update. So it's recommended to choose the correct method to implement your operation as per the specification. Here's an example of an API where I will list all restaurants within a zip code. So I want to query all restaurants based on the value of zip code provided by the client. So in this case, I'm going to use get method and interact at api.anycompany.com slash restaurants, providing my zip value. So I'm hosting this API on AWS with Amazon API Gateway and have a Lambda provision as my compute backend. Now when this API is invoked, API Gateway will invoke the Lambda, which queries the backend database and responds with a JSON payload. So API Gateway returns the payload to the client. In this case, we have four restaurants with their addresses. Now let's say I need to enhance the API with a commonly requested feature to list the menu items a restaurant serves. So I am also interested to fetch the menu along with the restaurants in a zip code. Now with REST, you could pass a query parameter to tell the server you need the menu. So as you can see here, my request now includes a query parameter called menu parameter with toggle as yes. So API Gateway in this case passes both the parameters and passes it downstream to the Lambda function. So Lambda is responsible for forming the query to fetch the menu and also query our backend. Now the response payload includes an additional field named menu with potential menu items. So in each of the restaurant object, you will have menu items as an array. Now let's move over to GraphQL API concepts. So GraphQL is a strongly typed query language designed to allow clients to ask for just the data they want. So a client sends a request by combining a static slash GraphQL path with HTTP post and passes a GraphQL query in the body. So the interaction for the clients is very simple. The server will respond according to the requested fields specified in the query, so the control is in the body. Now let's go back to a previous example. So let's say I have a weather API in GraphQL and I might send this query. I will say I want to get weather for a specific zip code and for that zip code, I want current temperature and the forecast. Or if I want to get all the restaurants in a zip code and I want the name and address of the restaurant, client is responsible for creating the query and delivering it in the body. At the heart of GraphQL query language, there is a schema which consists of three things, type, a query, and mutations. So type in our example would be restaurant. So we are working with an object of restaurant in this case. Now it can have many different properties, but we will define a restaurant to have an ID, name, address, state, zip, and an optional list of menu items. GraphQL has its own language to write GraphQL schemas the GraphQL schema definition language, also called as SDL. So the syntax is well-defined and are part of the official GraphQL specification. So here we have object types, restaurant and menu with their attributes. On the right-hand side, we have two more constructs of GraphQL schema, a query and a mutation. So you will use query to fetch any data with GraphQL so let's say you want to fetch all restaurants, you will create a query get restaurants. So another example would be to fetch a single restaurant with a specific ID and zip, then you will create a query with get restaurant and necessary parameters. Now if you want to modify data with GraphQL, you use mutation. So on bottom right, we have two mutations, one for adding a restaurant and another to delete it. Now let's pick our previous restaurant example and see how GraphQL works. So if you want to list all restaurants in a zip code, you will do a HTTP post because GraphQL typically only accepts post with control payload in the body. And we will invoke slash GraphQL static URL path. 
So every single request would flow to the backend in the exact same format if you just look at the URL. So AWS AppSync is a managed service that helps us create and manage GraphQL APIs. So at the heart of AppSync, we have something called as AppSync Resolvers. So resolvers help us resolve many different backends. We will talk about that in detail in a while. So if I want to get all restaurants, then my client will construct a query that looks like this with the name and address. So we are passing the literal zip value as a parameter. So in this example, client will send this query in the HTTP post payload and the AppSync service will be responsible for passing the query, invoking my resolver and returning the response. Now, if I want to request for the menu items along with my restaurants, as a client, only thing I need to change is to include the menu attribute in my query. So as you can see here, I'm including a new field menu and then I want the name of the item in that. If I also want more details about the menu items, example, I, I, I want the name, price, and whether the item is gluten-free or not, as a client, all I need to do is include the necessary attributes in my query, and my backend GraphQL API will understand what I want and provide the specific results. So you can see the client is controlling the response by specifying the exact fields it needs. Now, as we have seen the core concepts, let's look at how do you create and manage REST APIs on AWS with Amazon API Gateway. API Gateway is a managed service that lets you create easily scalable and cost-effective REST APIs. So it's paper use, so you only pay for the request your customers make. API Gateway is fully managed. It allows any consumers, whether it's a mobile or web app, IoT device to consume REST APIs by invoking it. So API Gateway is directly integrated with CloudWatch, which provides you monitoring and alerting capabilities. And API Gateway can nearly invoke all the backends you might need. So it can talk to Lambda functions, Kinesis data streams, any EC2 backend, DynamoDB, any public endpoints, or any apps that are privately protected in your VPC. API Gateway provides you with inbuilt mechanism for caching your API responses and throttling the API calls based on quota you configure. It also provides integration with AWS IAM, Cognito for authorization and Lambda custom authorizers to integrate with your existing IDP. So all these features are inbuilt and managed by AWS, taking away the pain and efforts you might need to implement it from scratch. So here's the same restaurant example we have been looking at implemented in API Gateway. We have three different APIs backed by separate Lambda function responsible for fetching the restaurants and menu based on the values in the path and query parameters. API Gateway automatically passes the path and query string params and sends it downstream to the Lambda function in this case. Let's see in detail how API Gateway actually processes the request. So when it receives the request with the path parameter slash restaurant and values in query parameters, zip and menu, API Gateway will construct a standard payload format, which is currently called payload format version 2.0, and then pass that payload format downstream to the Lambda function. Now Lambda function then simply passes the input format, looks for the details it needs, and then queries the backend database. Let's talk about how you can implement GraphQL APIs now. So the most critical component of GraphQL is the server, which does the heavy lifting of understanding your query, invoking the relevant backend, and returning the response. So if you plan to set this up on your own, there are open source options such as Apollo GraphQL Server or Express GraphQL uh, and some more but you will be responsible for provisioning, securing, scaling, and managing the server if you go this route. But there is another way with AWS AppSync. So it is fully managed and serverless. It can also interact with nearly any backend you might need, and this is done through resolvers. So these resolvers can interact with nearly any data source. This can be Amazon DynamoDB, Aurora, or Amazon Elasticsearch. Lambda functions, or even any HTTP APIs. 
AppSync is also integrated with CloudWatch, so you have the ability to monitor your logs and get insights. So what are resolvers? Resolvers are responsible for retrieving fields from data sources and mapping to schema. So resolvers are how AWS AppSync translates GraphQL requests and fetches information from your backend resources. So if you remember our schema for restaurant, which is defined on the left here, we are going to map the attributes of restaurant to a DynamoDB table. So we will do that because this information about restaurant is typically static. It doesn't change very often. So let's save this information in a DynamoDB table called restaurant by having a resolver mapping. Now for the menu items, we will create a different data source, uh, Lambda in this case. So Lambda data source will be invoked when we ask menu for a restaurant. Again, we want to do this because menu items are generally dynamic based on supply or demand or based on pricing. So in this example, we have two data sources and two resolvers, one that goes to DynamoDB and the other that goes to Lambda. Let's see how AppSync performs a query resolution when it gets a query like this. So in this case, we are asking for restaurants. I want to get all restaurants with attributes such as name, address, state, and menu. Specifically in menu, we are asking for name, price, and other details. So when AppSync sees this query, first thing it's going to do is map first set of data to DynamoDB resolver because that's how we configured it at the backend. It will then perform a DynamoDB table scan operation to fetch all restaurants in the database. When that completes, AppSync will invoke the Lambda resolver for each data row, that is restaurant entry that came out of DynamoDB. So the Lambda function responsible will look for menu items that your restaurant can provide in real time. So in this case, we are invoking two different resolvers in backend. Your client is oblivious to this. Now, how do you modify data with APIs? So on the left, we have REST example. We might do an HTTP post to modify or add a new restaurant. So we are providing all the data fields in payload required to add a new restaurant. On the right side with GraphQL, remember we will always use a post slash GraphQL regardless of the operation you are invoking. So what changes here is we are specifying a mutation in our Graph Query payload called add restaurant. So mutation is for adding or modifying data. So we are going to provide the exact same attributes as REST needed to add a new restaurant. Now, one question you might be asking is, how do I decide which API pattern to choose? Well, this can be a big decision for your project. So one aspect you can consider is the development experience. So with REST, the client code is typically built in JavaScript. So all browsers support it. There are a lot of handy tools such as curl, postman available to accelerate your development and testing. So in general, REST APIs are widely accepted and the ecosystem is fairly mature and there's a good chance you might be already using it. On GraphQL side, typically you will use a client or SDK to interact with APIs as client will handle queries, subscriptions to server and automate certain processes such as let's say schema validation, batching, etc. So you don't need a specific client to work with GraphQL though. You might want to start out by issuing GraphQL results with a regular HTTP uh, client, then later switch to a GraphQL optimized client as your application grows in complexity. So you can use tools such as GraphQL, which is a graphical interactive in-browser GraphQL IDE as your playground. Each of them have its own pros and cons. Let's see some of those. REST API's data size is defined by the server and it has to match the response schema. So for a GraphQL API, that data size can change depending on the data requested by client. So GraphQL is more flexible, allowing the server to only return what's asked for. For payload shape for REST API, will be identical every time a schema is static. While for GraphQL, payload shape will change based on what is asked by the client. Now, describability is not native to REST and it relies on specifications such as Swagger in order for your APIs to be fully discoverable. But as GraphQL works on a properly formed schema, it is by design natively describing. GraphQL enables better analytics on the backend. 
So with REST, as you get entire data, you can only track at entire API level, while with GraphQL, as you can retrieve specific data elements, you can gain insights about which data elements are in demand and aren't being used by clients anymore. So pretty powerful. Lastly, to put it simply, REST is a thin client fat server model. The bulk of processing and control is placed on server, stripping power from the clients. While this worked well, but as devices grow in processing power, this may need rethinking. So in GraphQL, we have a fat client, fat server model in which client is responsible for controlling the expected data format and server for structuring the data. So this is extremely powerful when we consider the data requested will be used for specific purposes by different clients. Now there are typically other considerations to nail down your choice. Like how many data sources do you have? So if you have a lot of data sources, you might want to go with GraphQL because you can abstract away the data sources in the backend and simply invoke the one based on the requested data. Another consideration, do you expect the data sources to change? So if you do, this might be a candidate for GraphQL as you can swap the resolvers easily. Then what are the clients for your APIs? Do you control the clients? So if you don't control the clients, it might be difficult to deploy a GraphQL client as it introduces some additional components. And finally, what is the skill set of your developers? Very important. So if all your developers are comfortable with REST, so it may not make sense to go all in GraphQL with tight deadlines. Having said that, you should always test the grounds by having that pilot use case implemented with GraphQL if other considerations are tilting towards that way. This brings me to the most exciting section. Let's hear from SGX on their API patterns, considerations, and learnings in building an enterprise-grade API platform on AWS. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Before we proceed, here is the background of my organization. Singapore Exchange is Asia's leading multi-asset exchange operating in equities, derivatives, and fixed income markets. We also operate Asia's only multi-partner and multi-asset exchange-led sustainability platform. Headquartered in Tripoli, rated Singapore, we are globally recognized for our risk management and clearing capabilities. Before we dive into the specifics of RESOL APIs, let us look at the architectural principles we evaluated and prioritized for our design to stick behind RESTful APIs over GraphQL. Our functional considerations include client-server separation, clearly separating the concepts of client and server, like user interface with the client and data processing with the server. Stateless, to let our server process each request individually and separately regardless of the client state. Uniform interface, this is perhaps the most contested and defining quality of REST and is one of the definitive quality we deliberated to have with our nature of APIs we are exposing for our consumers. Our non-functional considerations include catchability. As we present the static data for our market data APIs, we had a clear use case to have a HTTP cache infrastructure to efficiently present our contents. Security, the APIs we broadcast are anonymous in nature, and while the main benefit of GraphQL is to let the client query for just the data they need, this can be a huge problem for us as we cannot control the end user behavior. When it comes to monitoring, we could not leverage our existing enterprise synthetic monitoring tools just yet for GraphQL APIs as monitoring our API resources with the HTTP specification could not be applied. Moving on, now why do we use AWS API Gateway? AWS API Gateway acts as a front door for our systems in cloud, which exposes the RESTful APIs. With API Gateway as a service, we handle API version management, API authorization, traffic management, request or response modeling, throttling, and the API analytics. Now, looking at our RESTful API design patterns with AWS API Gateway, the first type you see here is our North-South communication where we have our end users accessing our corporate website over internet, also invoking our RESTful APIs for loading the dynamic contents. Our users are globally distributed, so we rely on public-facing edge-optimized API gateway endpoint, which are so closer to our users, and thereby we present the contents with reduced latency. The second type you see here is our east-west communication, where we have our microservices hosted inside VPCs, 
interacting with the private API gateway for its communication with the other system to complete any transaction. This design was deliberated to avoid any implicit or hidden dependencies between our microservices and to have a well-defined APIs as our communication interface for each of the service itself. Let us look at our API lifecycle. On the left, you see is our typical API lifecycle stages, method request, integration request, integration response, and method response of our RESTful APIs with AWS API Gateway. On the right, you see is our integration layer, which are basically inside our VPC connected through the VPC link. There are a couple of activities we do to fail fast when it comes to method request. Validation to ensure having the HTTP request specification as needed for our APIs. Authorization, custom authorization to ensure the user have proper authorization to invoke our APIs. Also, we ensure we only perform the basic request specification validation with the inbuilt validator and not through the Lambda function. This is basically a design opinion we enforce to ensure we are not burning the free credits, neither incurring additional consumption charges for the Lambda execution. The second step is about the integration request where any request remapping is done as needed for our integration services before we pass on the request to them. The third step is on the integration response. Here we basically do a header mappings with the stage variables, also say a passing back and access control allow origin as a header with a static value pointing back to a website, say www.sgx.com. The final step is on the method response where we finally do a response mapping as needed for our custom error response codes. Moving on, how do we monitor our APIs? I can categorize our API gateway monitoring into two, activity monitoring and administration monitoring. From the activity monitoring itself, we have CloudWatch for access logs, CloudWatch alarms to trigger any anomalies, say triggering an anomaly for any integration latency and bad HTTP status code, also, as a principle for our distributed microservices, we basically tag a correlation ID, part of our HTTP payload, to get a complete picture of a HTTP request traversing through various AWS services with our CloudWatch logs. From the administration monitoring, we have a cloud trial to detect and alert any destructive changes, and AWS config for tracking ongoing configuration changes. Finally, when it comes to production, we have multiple layers of protection for our RESTful APIs. On the first layer, WAF as a web application firewall to prevent from any common web exploits. IAM resource policy to limit our API invocation exposure to select IP ranges, say our data protection tool. Throttling to throttle our APIs for the microservices as per the need. And traversing to the second layer, we have a Lambda authorizer to validate the user authorization before letting them invoke our APIs. Finally, when the APIs are invoked and passed over to the integration layer, they carry a client certificate which our microservices validate before accepting the API connection from the API gateway. And that concludes my presentation, and I hope by now you have a great insights into building a production-grade RESTful APIs. Passing over to Anshul. Thanks, Badri, for sharing with us today. It's always good to learn from an actual customer implementation. Now, if you're looking to get started on APIs with AWS, there are a couple of resources on screen. So on top, you have a serverless workshop for getting started with API Gateway. And on bottom, we have a developer guide to dive deep into GraphQL and AWS AppSync. You can keep learning beyond the summit with resources from AWS training and certification for containers and serverless. So you can explore labs, white papers, and other technical resources by visiting a learning library. Well, this brings us to the end. A shout out to Badri and Singapore Exchange team for sharing their work with us today. And thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. Please complete the feedback survey and let us know how did you find this session. Your feedback is valuable to us and will allow us to build an improved summit experience for you in future.